Lisa Hardy needs an introduction. She's um, been a member of the British Institute of Florence's History of Art faculty for some time, um, and is in teaching at the moment on the modern course I just mentioned. Um, and I think he's known to many of you uh, as a, a significant expert on particularly the Renaissance uh, art of Florence. So over to you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you so much Simon, for that introduction. I want to say to everybody that I've given this lecture today a very broad title uh, in terms of calling it power and sexuality in Renaissance art. I feel that's a little bit <laughs> unwieldy and obviously it's a huge topic and I won't be able to address everything. So this is going to be a very kind of idiosyncratic view of mine of the topic, something I've been thinking about for a long time, but I haven't necessarily come to you know, defined uh, conclusions about the uh, topic. What I'd like to do is lay the ideas out there for you as a kind of heuristic tool. Now that was a word that when we heard in grad school, one of our professors say that they were going to, you know, give us some kind of heuristic lesson. Uh, the only thing worse that they could say was that it was going to be the Socratic method, that it just meant that there was no lesson plan and the seminar was going to be completely vague. Uh, I hope not to do that with you. Um, but what I mean by heuristic um, approach is that I'd like to open up the floor for thought and hopefully for a good discussion at the end of today's lecture, uh, because I know that many of you will have, um, you know, much to add uh, from works of art that you've seen and uh, different ideas that are raised during today's lecture. Um, so I originally began thinking about this uh, lecture um, a couple years ago when the whole Me Too movement began. And so much in the news was about the way power and authority are abused um, and the way it's enacted on the female body, especially, but not exclusively, as we will see in today's lecture. And I wanted to really look at the way that Renaissance art in Italy reflects so many of these issues that we're dealing with today. Uh, and to see the way that they treat things in some ways quite differently and in some ways in a similar manner. That said, um, I am a cultural historian and I approach this uh, from the point of view of what do we know of people's lives as they were lived and what people experienced in terms of you know, abuses of authority and sexual abuse, especially, uh, and what images would they have been seeing in their everyday life that inflected their attitudes about this topic. So, so many times I come away from an art historian's lecture just dazzled by their revelations and the way they explain, you know, all the details in a certain painting. And I will do my best to explain the paintings uh, in my own terms, in my own words. Uh, but what I would like especially is to be able to show you how people lived their lives with these concepts. And this is what I mean by that. So here, for instance, are two images, one uh, by Domenico di Michelino and the other one by the Maestro de Trionfi Landau Finlay. Um, in fact, the one of the Maestro is sometimes attributed to uh, Michelino as well, showing the scene of Susanna and the elders. Um, and these are, you know, very sort of humble, small panel paintings uh, that would have been used as domestic uh, furniture and domestic decoration in Florentine homes. And I'll be explaining that as I go along. So there's not going to be necessarily today a huge division between, you know, high art of the kind that you're used to experiencing in art galleries and churches and domestic furnishings with artistic decoration on them. And I think it's important to note that people during the Renaissance didn't necessarily see that division um, themselves either. So um, domestic furniture was decorated by the greatest um, artists, as you'll be seeing, and these were things that everyday people would have been in contact with all the time. So to start with, uh, of course, you know, the cover, um, the image that this uh, talk started with, 
uh, was is an image of Judith and Holofernes, and I'll be coming back to Judith uh, later in the lecture. But let's start with Susanna and the Elders then. Uh, Susanna and the Elders is something you see depicted a lot when you're in Italian museums, um, but it's something that you're not necessarily familiar with if you come from the Protestant tradition, because uh, the book of Daniel is not in uh, the King James nor in any of the Protestant Bibles. Uh, so the book of Daniel tells the story of Susanna and the elders, uh, which is basically the following. There's this um, young, beautiful uh, housewife of, you know, a, 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 a Israelite housewife uh, who's very devout uh, and she lives a very calm and secluded life, but she likes in the privacy of her garden to take her bath. And one day these two um, you know, elders of the community are wandering by and they spy her in the garden and they think, wouldn't it be wonderful to have sex with her? So um, they come up with this scheme that they approach her and they say, if you don't have sex with us, we're gonna denounce you. And we're going to tell uh, the judge that you have been um, unfaithful to your husband, you're an adulteress, you've been seeing this young man that's been sneaking into your garden and you're gonna be stoned to death. Now, this is a painting by Lorenzo Lotto that hangs in the Uffizi gallery that shows this scene of the elders approaching Susanna in her garden as she's undressed for her bath and they're denouncing her. Here, just a close up on the scene, you can see that there's a scroll on the top that has this writing on it that says in Latin, we bear witness that we have seen her lay with a youth who then fled. And her little thought bubble reads, I would rather die than sin. So we get the very virtuous Susanna resisting the advances of these elders. Um, and the way the story continues, Susanna is brought before the judge Daniel, a young judge, who's um, very, very astute. He questions each of the old men separately. They give different testimony that's contradictory and they are instead uh, accused and condemned to death. And Susanna is vindicated. Now, apart from the interpretations of this story um, that I'm gonna be showing you, there are of course allegorical representations of Susanna as representing truth and virtue and all the good Christian um, you know, ethical values. Um, but what I'm interested in showing you is, first of all, the position of Susanna crouching there um, beside her bath is a, a echo of the figure of the crouching Venus, these Roman copies of the third century Greek original representation of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And these are just three of many, many um, statues in this particular pose. So there's a reference already to Susanna as you know, sort of mirroring a goddess of love as well, of you know, the erotic is being introduced in this image. Not only is it introduced by her pose, but I put to you that the fact that Susanna is not merely naked, nudity on its own, um, yes, can represent absolute purity and truth and innocence, but she's almost in a scene of striptease with her clothes you know, falling off of her uh, very um, sort of suggestively at her feet. And you can see here the way she's standing on these clothes and you know, she's got her chopines in the back, you know, these these sort of slippers with the platform uh, heel on them. And not only that, but here in the foreground, her stockings and garters next to her little slippers. So there's a suggestiveness involved in the, not just the nude figure, but the undress. It's different to be nude or to be naked. So Susanna is in a state of suggestive undress. Now we see this even more uh, exaggerated in many of the uh, Venetian painters such as Tintoretto. In this painting of Susanna and the Elders uh, by Tintoretto, um, you see a woman uh, who is not just nude coming out of the bath and she's got her clothes scattered all around her, uh, but she's looking in a mirror, which is normally uh, a, an allegory of vanity, right? So that's not a sign of a very, you know, wholesome, upright, um, you know, Israelite um, housewife. 
really what we're seeing in Tintoretto's depiction, and of course here you can see one of the old men and here's another one peeking around at her. Um, what we're seeing here, let me get a close up on what is at Susanna's feet. Uh, we can see um, her jewels, her rings, her earrings, her hair ornaments, her pearls, see very good close up on her bodice here. You can see her jewelry, her foot sort of very suggestively uh, in the foreground, this um, jar of uh, ointment or perfume. And Susanna with this blonde, blonde hair, um, I suggest to you is a type that we see in Venetian art that was very current of the courtesan. So here is a representation, um, here is one by Tintoretto of a woman, her identity is not certain, it's believed to represent the courtesan poet Veronica Franco, the most renowned courtesan poet of the 16th century in Venice. There were many, many, many of these women uh, at the time uh, in the 16th century. Uh, they've been written about a lot, Mary Gerard and others uh, in the book, The Honest Courtesan discusses the phenomenon these very highly paid uh, prostitutes. They were more like, in some sense, uh, geishas uh, that were very trained in uh, various, um, you know, uh, literary and um, musical arts. This is a possible portrait by Tintoretto, also of Veronica Franco. Tintoretto and Franco were good friends. So this representation of the courtesan with her breasts bared, with these pearls, and normally with blonde hair is very common. Now, leaving Venice, I wanna say, it's not just Venice that had this tendency to eroticize the body of Susanna and this scene of Susanna and the elders. Here's a Florentine artist, Alessandro Allori representing Susanna and the elders at the same time as Tintoretto in the 1560s. Um, and what we're seeing here is really Susanna um, sort of with that same sort of blonde hair and overly coiffed and the pearls and everything. And she's in this very compromising position with the two elders. Um, it's difficult to tell from her position and her facial expression just how distressed she is. She may be just a little confused at this threesome that she seems to be involved in uh, sort of spontaneously. Um, and there is also this very highly sexualized position of this one elder here who is, you know, sort of visually penetrating her here and then with his hand, of course, between her thighs. And note she is also sitting on a yellow garment I want you to keep in mind that yellow was a, a color that was worn by prostitutes. With the sumptuary laws of the period, prostitutes often had to wear yellow garments, specifically yellow veils. Uh, in Florence, this was quite an issue during the 16th century. But we see a very different depiction of Susanna and the elders in this painting by Artemisia Gentileschi from 1610. This is the earliest dated work we have by the brilliant young female painter, uh, daughter of Orazio Gentileschi. She was 17 years old, uh, it's estimated, when she painted this. Um, this is a very, very, um, for me anyway, powerful painting of the same scene. And it's an iconographic representation that we see nowhere else. Now, does it matter that it's a woman painting this? I would argue yes, and we can discuss that at the end of today's talk, if you will. Um, but we see nothing of that sort of playful um, erotization of the scene. Instead, we see a real sense of menace and of this young woman, and very probably Artemisia, uh, with the aid of a mirror, uh, represented her own body in this painting. Um, and. It's a, it's a painting that really expresses a lot of distress. And um, it's fascinating to me to see a, a woman's take on this. Now, of course, as we get to talking about Judith and Holofernes, we'll discuss uh, the issue of Artemisia's rape trial when she was raped by her instructor, Agostino Tassi. Um, but that is not gonna happen for another two years. So you can't read back this painting in terms of the trial for rape um, because it had not happened yet. In fact, she hadn't even met Tassi at this point, but she was most probably subjected to all kinds of harassment uh, by men coming and going in her father's art studio uh, and just living in Rome. Um, 
at the time. Now, just to point out, however, I'm going to be moving back and forth between scenes of women and men in power and how they tend to exert this kind of their sexual desire. So here is a painting painted by the Florentine painter Lodovico Cardi, known as Lodovico Cigoli often. And he painted this in the exact same year as uh, Artemisia's painting of uh, the uh, Susanna and the Elders. This represents Joseph and Potiphar's wife. This is from Genesis 39. Uh, this is where um, um, Potiphar's wife lusts for the young Joseph and invites him into her bed and he very virtuously pushes her away. And here we see a very kind of playful representation. We don't see the woman's lust as being overwhelming. We don't see the young man as being resisting in sort of a powerful way. It's represented as something as a kind of a, a playfulness. This was painted for Cardinal Scipione Borghese. If you know of him, a very uh, sophisticated um, a Roman uh, patron of art um, and a patron of uh, Caravaggio as well. And here uh, for uh, Borghese, Cigoli has produced um, a very kind of, you know, kind of sweet and playful representation of this scene of a lustful, powerful woman trying to uh, seduce a young man. Here's Tintoretto's representation of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Similarly, we see kind of, you know, a, an alluring woman definitely also in that same mold of a courtesan, very luscious flesh, wearing pearl jewelry and that, you know, quaffed blonde hair. And, you know, Joseph is sort of pulling away, but we don't see a lot of tension or power here. It's meant to really titillate uh, the male viewer. I put this painting in the same category of, uh, say, Titian's Venus of Orbino here, or even Manet's uh, Olympe, uh, you know, much later work, sort of showing these grand horizontal, these professional uh, courtesans, these women who um, were meant to be very sophisticated and alluring. And these are paintings showing them uh, for the male gaze as a subject of, um, of, of erotic desire. So when you compare these two paintings, does it matter that, you know, the 17 year old Artemisia painted this uh, Susanna and the Elders um, in the same year uh, that the 51 year old Chigoli painted Joseph and Potiphar's uh, wife? So um, I don't know. I, I think that's something that is worth looking at and worth uh, thinking about definitely. What I do find fascinating, if you look at the female sculptor, Properzia de Rossi, how she looks at Joseph and Potiphar's wife, look at the tension and the way that Potiphar's wife is reaching out and pulling at the robe on Joseph. And Joseph is just rushing away. You can see the movement in his body. But I'd like to emphasize the strength of that arm as it pulls that represents the force of that female desire. We're going to see that same strength in the arms of Artemisia's Judith as she slices off the head of Holofernes. So you see that kind of strong female self-assertion in these female artists showing this same scene. Now I want to move to another theme that we see so often in art of this time, um, and it's such an important theme. That's the story of, of course, the rape of Lucretia. This is reported in um, Livy's History of Rome, where he tells the story about a wine party that was being held at the home of Sextus uh, Tarquinius. Um, and there, Lucretia's wife, uh, excuse me, Lucretia's uh, husband, uh, Col uh, Colatinus uh, was bragging about how virtuous his wife was. So Tarquin comes and he's invited to see how virtuous and beautiful uh, his friend's wife is. And of course he starts lusting after her and he ends up sneaking into her house and raping her. Um, and then Lucretia as a virtuous Roman matron um, commits suicide out of the shame of this um, loss of honor. So this is a very powerful scene represented by Titian of the scene of Tarquin and Lucretia. Let me just point out for a moment, Lucretia, in terms of her body type, the jewelry, her hairstyle, 
her, uh, uh, the pearls is of a type as well. I'll be coming back to that. The thing that's important in the Renaissance is that Lucretia was considered an example for women and women modeled themselves to a great extent. Um, it, they did a lot of self-fashioning in terms of looking at Lucretia as the um, ideal married woman. So here on the base of this small statue, it's only about so big, um, it is a, um, it, there's an inscription of Lucretia. In this hand, she would have been holding a dagger, of course, to um, kill herself. There's an inscription here along the base of this piece of um, decorative statuary for a very wealthy home. And it reads, an example of chastity for married women. So to remain chaste rather than to give in to lust. Here's another example of a painting by Lorenzo Lotto of a woman who is inspired by Lucretia. This is a woman, presumably her husband is away Here's an empty seat where he would perhaps have been seated normally. And she's holding up a drawing. And the drawing that she's holding up is a picture of Lucretia committing suicide. And on the woman's face is an expression of such determination and strength as if to say, I will defend my honor with my life. Um, and this is clearly here also, this piece of paper on the uh, table beneath her reads, Following Lucretia's example, no dishonored woman should continue to live. Very strong statement in this portrait. Um, so we can see that women in the Renaissance were looking at this example of Lucretia as an example for themselves. Here are just a few other examples. Here's Palma Giovane's Tarquin and Lucretia. Check out the blonde hair and the very florid kind of, you know, dimpled body that recalls Titian's type as well as Tintoretto's in Susanna and the Elders. So I think we're seeing here also in these depictions of Lucretia, though Lucretia is meant as a symbol of virtuous women and a woman who won't give up her honor. And we could see in that woman's portrait where she has been represented as the virtuous Lucretia, still Lucretia's body is represented as an erotic object for the male gaze. And so we see that in all of these pictures, this repetition of this same kind of type of the Venetian courtesan body, um, so desirable. And here in a very, um, of course, salacious pose of, um, um, you know, being raped. Um, and of course, the fact that Lucretia stabs herself to death, um, it always gives an opportunity for the painter to show exposed breasts, right? To, in order to pierce the, her chest, she has to expose her breasts. So there's yet another opportunity for showing um, an erotic element. Now, this is a painting on a panel of wood, which brings me to the topic that I really wanna focus on now, which is the representations of Lucretia that would have been visible to actual Lucretias. Lucretia was a very common name during the Renaissance. This is a painting perhaps uh, it is definitely by Filippo Lippi, perhaps using as a model his um, um, common law wife, Lucrezia Buti. Um, and here is a painting of Lorenzo de' Medici's mother, Lucrezia Tornabuoni. Lucrezia is a name that shows up over and over and over again. I wish we had little buzzers that you could buzz as I go on talking. So every time you see the name Lucretia come up for the rest of this talk, you'll recognize that that was something very common, um, especially in, the Flor in Florentine circles uh, in the 15th century. So here is a painting by Botticelli. This is the story of Lucretia. Um, if you came upon it in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, it'd be hanging on the wall. It's very beautiful. And you would just think of it as a regular panel painting on wood. However, it was a piece of domestic um, um, furniture. So here it is hanging on the wall in the um, museum, uh, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. Um, and you can see it hanging up here above this chest. And I'll get back to that chest in a few moments. It was part of a spalliera. So a spalliera 
Here is an example in the Museo Horn here in Florence. You've got the bench, which is the lettuccio. So it's sort of like a, you can lift the lid and you can keep all your linens in there. If you have a surprise guest, you can make a little um, bed here for someone who comes to visit in the Renaissance. They like to have furniture that was adaptable as we do today. And on the back for your spalle or shoulders, there's a spalliera or shoulder rest. Actually, these can be very large and they're not necessarily attached to the lettuccio. They can be just on the wall used as a kind of wainscoting. And spalliera were often decorated with great paintings. So here is, we believe, a spalliera. It was created for the wedding in 1482 of Lorenzo di Pier Francesco de' Medici, the cousin of the uh, magnificent Lorenzo. Um, and so this was a wedding gift and it was meant to decorate the house of this young Medici um, prince. So this, of course, is the famous Primavera by Botticelli. But getting back to this Botticelli showing the death of Lucretia, this was a spalliera decorating the home of a patrician Florentine. And it shows the story of Lucretia being threatened by uh, uh, Tarquin. And over here, Lucretia lying dead on the ground. And of course, here is her family finding her. But look at some of the aspects here. Here is Lucretia being threatened by Tarquin. And here she is lying dead uh, on this bier. Above, there's a frieze above the, the door. I don't know if you could see that before when I'm showing you that. This is the frieze up above the scene of the threatening with by Tarquin. Is a scene of Judith's return to Bethulia. And here she is with her maid. And in her basket, she's got the head of Holofernes. And here is Botticelli's um, small panel of that same scene that's in the Uffizi. So we get a recall to that scene of killing a tyrant, right? This murder of a tyrant. And in the center on the column in the center of this is a statue of David and Goliath. So another murder of a tyrant. So Lucretia committing suicide is of course also the scene of the murder of a tyrant, um, but it is, um, it has, double valence as an image for virtuous women, but also political signification as well. Now I wanna talk about this wedding chest. Remember I mentioned that um, here, whoops, below this uh, in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum is this wedding chest. It's known as a cassone, this type of chest. And they were very, very common during the Renaissance. Um, it was a chest that was decorated very richly and given as a present at weddings. So the bride would put her trousseau and all of her uh, linens and goods in it. And the very prized cassone would often be placed in the bedroom um, of the couple and in the very, very important rooms of the house. And these would have been, been domestic furniture that would have been seen on a daily basis. Um, they would be carried in procession. Here you can see this poor servant carrying this wedding cassone on this wedding procession uh, when, the when the bride is being brought to her husband's home. They often came in sets, sort of his and hers. They were painted on all of the sides and the top and often on the inside. So here you have a nude woman and here's a nude man on this pair of wedding cassone from Florence in the 1450s. So you get an idea that um, these were chests that were meant uh, to impart lessons and were meant to be viewed in the private home and the setting of the bedroom often. So here is a detail of this wedding chest painted by the master of Maradi that also shows the rape of Lucretia. So just like we had that wainscoting panel, this is also domestic furniture that's painted to show this same scene. So uh, here, um, let me just show the close-ups on it. Here's Lucretia meeting um, Tarquinus, uh, Tarquin, Sextus Tarquinius uh, for the first time. Here he is coming up to her house and here he is in her bedroom. Let's just close up on those scenes. And somebody from the time, presumably, has written the names Lucretia and Sextus Tarquinius here under his horse, just so you don't forget who these are. And you can see her um, sort of innocently welcoming him to the house. And here he is offering his hand as he kind of gallantly strolls up the stairs, only to pull a sword on her when she's in bed 
and threaten her before he rapes her. So you see this scene represented on this domestic architect, uh, domestic furniture in the 15th century. Now back to Botticelli, Botticelli and his workshop indeed, because many of these pieces of furniture were workshop productions. I don't want to suggest that every single brush stroke was painted by the master himself, but this is yet another story. This is not a biblical story or a story from antiquity. This is a story from Botticelli's Decameron. It is actually one of the most disturbing stories in the Decameron. Uh, close second, uh, I think, is Griselda. Um, but this story of Nastagio degli Onesti is reproduced over and over and over again on Cassoni and domestic furniture during this period in the 15th century. So it's important to tell the story if you don't know it. It's from the fifth day. It's the eighth story on the fifth day. It tells the story of this young man, Nastagio. And here we can see Nastagio talking with his friends. He's very disappointed because he's in love with the daughter of Paolo Traversari. She won't give him the time of day. She won't return his love. Um, and he almost bankrupts himself throwing great feasts for her. He spends lots of money and she just mocks him. So he goes away and he goes for a walk in this forest one day and he's just distraught and he comes upon the strangest scene. As he's walking along, he sees this crazed man on a horse with his sword raised chasing this naked woman and he's setting his hounds upon her and she's screaming and screaming for help. So Nastagio rushes forward and with this stick tries to defend the woman and the knight says, don't you dare defend this woman because you have to know that we're both dead. When we were alive, she wouldn't give me the time of day. She wouldn't pay attention to my love. I killed myself with this sword. And afterward, in the afterlife, we both ended up in hell. And our punishment, and this is very Dantesque, um, is to every week rush through this forest and I chase her and I kill her. I cut her open. And here he is cutting open her and from the back and he pulls out her heart and he throws it to his dogs to devour. This is a story that was reproduced over and over again. Nastagio gets a clever idea uh, about this uh, from this story. Nastagio thinks, why don't I invite this girl that I'm in love with and all her family for a party out here in the woods and they will see this story, what happens, and she won't be able to resist me. And indeed, in the end, the girl, when she sees this scene reenacted, this kind of ghostly story happening, she right away says, I, I've changed my mind. I love you. You can have your way with me. And she makes herself sexually available to the young man who then turns around and says, no, 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 I want to marry you. He does sort of the honorable thing. And they all live happily ever after, go figure. So here is a close-up on him pulling that heart out of her back. And over here is um, another um, painting from a Cassone wedding chest painted by Davide Ghirlandaio. You can see it's not of the same quality as the Botticelli workshop production, um, but you can see that uh, this panel that's in the Brooklyn Museum represents that same scene uh, of the uh, young woman being chased uh, by her former lover. And here is the scene also from the same wedding chest, but this is in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. This is when the scene is being reenacted at the banquet for Nastagio's guests. Um, and I'd like to point out to you that you won't always know when you see these paintings in museums because uh, that they came from a wedding chest because you know furniture breaks apart over the ages. And even though the art can be preserved, it's very rare to find the entire chest entire. And that's why we find these slices or pieces of these paintings in different parts of the world often. So, you know, what does it mean to a woman to see these kind of images every day when they go about their business before they go to bed at night? You know, this sort of very, very powerful, um, you know, repetition at, of these images of you know, sort of male oppression and male control over the female body. Um, I'd like to suggest um, that we should go easy with this and how we interpret it. You know, these kind of stories, um, it's dubious how, you know, how oppressive women found this or not. Uh, this is one example I like to show to my students when we go visit the museum, uh, the Museo Horn. Uh, this was painted by Filipino Lippi. It's a very small sort of panel 
I think it was part of a piece of furniture, uh, but I have no way of um, proving that. This shows Queen Vashti uh, leaving uh, the royal palace after she's been um, banished by her husband, the Persian king ah uh, Ahasuerus. Um, and here she is going out into this abandoned nowhere land after she's been discarded by her husband. Did images like this make an impression, a powerful impression on women and women in terms of thinking of their own position in life? I don't know. I think that's worth discussing, you know, the impact that it had um, within their domestic realm, because we know that Florentine women did not have a lot of access to the outside world. They lived very much within the domestic sphere. So the decorations that they saw either in their home or on the walls of churches would have been the images that really stayed with them that they saw repeatedly over and over. Okay, now I have to talk about Judith and Holofernes. Uh, Judith is just so important. Um, and she is uh, probably, um, you know, one of the foremost uh, figures represented in Florentine art of this period. This of course is the Donatello, Judith and Holofernes, uh, Botticelli's discovery of the body of Holofernes after Judith has sliced off uh, his head. Um, and here is a representation by Caravaggio of the same scene of Judith beheading Holofernes. Very, very dramatic scene painted in 1599, uh, really emphasizing, you know, sort of the, the horror and the power of this woman, this kind of delicate woman, you know, with the blade in her hand slicing off the head of the tyrant. Of course, Judith has stepped up to volunteer herself sexually to Holofernes in order to save the Jewish people. Um, so, you know, Judith as a heroine uh, um, to the, the Jewish people has done this and she's sort of being represented uh, sort of heroically, but also there's a, quite a bit of horror in the way this scene is represented. I'd like to suggest to you that, you know, all Romans had in mind during this period, the execution of Beatrice Cenci. Uh, this was a very famous patricide, which had been committed by Beatrice, uh, her stepmother and um, her brothers uh, in September of 1598, um, because her father, Francesco, uh, had abused her, had sexually uh, violated her, had beat her uh, brothers, had mistreated and sexually violated almost every member of the household by some accounts. It's very hard to get a handle on all the true facts of this case, because just like tabloids today tend to exaggerate and play up, you know, uh, scandals. The Chenchi scandal was everywhere, but she was publicly executed at the foot of the Ponte Sant'Angelo, um, and she became really a cause celeb. There are so many um, plays and movies and paintings and, um, you know, all kinds of stories about her. Here's just one, a play by uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley uh, about uh, uh, Beatrice Cenci. Uh, so there's sort of this image in, at least in Roman consciousness at the time of this story. Um, so sort of the pathos of this young woman who's been violated and unjustly um, persecuted, and she comes to be represented by many as a kind of heroine. I'm not going to go into all the details here of the, you know, of the case, um, but just suffice it to say that it was very, very brutal. Um, her elder brother was tortured on the cart as he was brought to the place of execution, um, and he was um, very uh, brutally uh, murdered and had his uh, head smashed with a mallet, his body quartered. Uh, she and her stepmother both had their heads uh, sliced off and the younger brother uh, was, um, uh, was had his life spared at the last minute, but he was forced to watch all of this and for the rest of his life, he was sentenced to the galleys. So quite a brutal scene. Another Roman artist, Artemisia Gentileschi painted this scene. Um, and I mentioned Artemisia's uh, trial for rape, uh, be, excuse me, the trial that involved Artemisia and the rape by Agostino Tassi, her teacher. Uh, I can't, I don't have time to go into that whole case here. There are those who claim that she painted the face of her uh, rapist 
on Holofernes. There are many versions of Judith beheading Holofernes painted by Gentileschi. This is just um, one of the, my favorite uh, one in the Uffizi. And here, of course, the same image that I used at the initial uh, slide for this lecture by her good friend, Cristofano Allori, Judith showing the head of Holofernes in her hand, a much more kind of poised and delicate, tidy image of Judith. Um, Judith is dressed immaculately in this brocaded garment. Um, Allori represented his mistress uh, in this, you know, her features in this painting. Here instead, we get the very, very, um, you know, uh, dramatic and realistic scene of the blood splurting out of uh, the neck of Holofernes. Uh, Judith has got her sleeves rolled up to keep the blood from getting everywhere, but there are splatters of blood even on her breasts. Uh, so we see a very, very different and powerful depiction once again by a female artist of this same scene. Okay, there's another piece of domestic uh, furniture that I'm going to discuss now, and that's the birth tray or the desco da parto. The desco da parto is something that was given when a woman uh, had uh, delivered a baby and the birth tray would be brought as a gift to the new mother and it would have playful or pleasant scenes on it. A very, very common scene for the birth tray in Renaissance Florence, this is a Florentine tradition, um, is scenes of the triumph of love, which is what we're seeing on this tray, and I'll get back to it in a moment. There are other kinds of playful scenes like this of boys playing in the street. This is in the Davanzati Museum. And on the reverse side of that tray, there's also images on the reverse, we see two little babies playing with each other and we see one tugging on the other's testicles or penis. Um, this was something that was meant to be, give the mother kind of a, 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 a you know, a, a, a laugh, something to cheer her up when she's coming out of this, you know, traumatic experience of giving birth. Um, and so these birth trays were often decorated with scenes of love or children, but especially masculinity and sexual deeds. Not always, but usually. So going back to this birth tray that I showed you before, the triumph of love, we can see Cupid or Eros here shooting that arrow and there are all these little putti around the top. But I want to focus on these two scene, the scenes in the front. Here is Phyllis riding the back of Aristotle. So you see a woman dominating a man. So that would have given people a good chuckle at the time. And over here at the right, we see Delilah with Samson asleep on her lap. So this is representing the scene from the book of Judges 16, where we see Delilah um, who's tricked Samson. She's got the secret out of him for his power and she's giving him a haircut here. Um, what's interesting about this scene is a few things. First of all, Samson is in a drunken stupor. Samson is a real boozer. Samson is one of the most unlikely heroes of the Bible. Um, he's very uh, uncontrolled, undisciplined. He goes to whores um, and he really has a drinking problem. Um, so he's a very problematic hero. To they, nowadays, we would call him an anti-hero. And I think in Italian Renaissance art, there's often a lot of confusion about how to represent uh, Samson in relation to Delilah. But especially Delilah, you know, the fact that she has the scissors in her hand, because the Bible tells us that she calls in these men, she decides to, um, to um, find out the secret of Samson's strength and to cut off his, you know, to, to, you know, to give him away because she's offered a lot of money. She's offered 1100 pieces of silver by the Philistines. Um, and so she has this monetary uh, impulse. Um, so Delilah is not a heroine like Judith who's doing something with a sharp blade to a man uh, because she is redeeming you know, her people or she's in somehow a virtuous person. She's doing this because she has a money interest and she wants to help the Philistines who are the enemies of the Israelites. Now, in a in a series of paintings, Mantegna shows various heroic women. And this one, hmm, heroic, I think is maybe not the right word, notorious women, perhaps. Uh, this is Delilah giving Samson his little haircut here uh, beside the tree. And interestingly enough, um, in this painting, which has a much more serious mood to it than the birth tree, uh, we see this sort of dead tree with this stump cut off sort of mirroring the symbolic castration 
of Delilah cutting off the hair from Samson. So when she cuts his hair, he loses his strength. It's the secret of all his power. It's sort of his Achilles heel. And here on the tree is a very serious message telling us that woman is three times worse than the devil himself. Other Renaissance painters seem a little confused about what we're supposed to get from this scene. Here's a very kind of neutral scene uh, that Moroni is depicting one of the Philistines cutting off Samson's hair while he's kind of napping on this bench with this sort of, you know, gentle countryside. And Delilah is perfectly well dressed, like a very, uh, you know, sort of tidy uh, aristocrat. Here, though, Tintoretto is showing us Samson and Delilah in a way that we're more accustomed to seeing, and that is dressed in yellow and with her breasts exposed and pearls. Yes, we're seeing this image of a Venetian courtesan. Another Northern artist, Padovanino, gives us a similar representation of Delilah. And finally, Florentine Cellini, I just love this because it's a case for holding gunpowder um, decorated by the great goldsmith. And he's showing Delilah here with Samson asleep on his lap and she's being handed scissors. Basically he's saying, you know, don't get me messed up with a woman like Delilah. She's just a powder keg. Okay, so what I'd like to say now in sort of pulling this talk to an end and you know pulling it together, and I know it's been a very unruly talk, I've been trying to focus on relations of power between men and women. Um, I could have expanded this much more. For instance, um, I didn't talk about, you know, Jove and the many rapes of Europa, rape of Io, um, you know, or indeed the rape of Ganymede. Uh, the many scenes where Jove turns into an animal um, and seduces or rapes um, mortals, um, you know, disguised in these various forms. The rape of the young boy Ganymede, who J Zeus turns himself into an eagle, and then he takes Ganymede up to Olympus, where Ganymede becomes his cupbearer uh, for the rest of his life, uh, is a scene that is represented in a number of cases. Um, and I haven't gone into um, sort of the homoerotic and various relations of power between um, men and men or women and women. There just isn't time to look at those things today. Um, but I have to say that even this, we have to look at and take with a grain of salt. Here, by the way, are the claws of Jupiter just, just you know, getting into those thighs of that chubby little Ganymede. Um, we have to be careful before we interpret such scenes as being necessarily uh, erotic, or let's say exclusively erotic, because here is a representation of the rape of Ganymede above the Battle of Monte Murlo, which was a very, very important battle for um, Cosimo the First. Uh, the first Grand Duke of Tuscany. In 1537, this battle was fought at Monte Murlo, which was near Prato. Uh, and Vasari tells us that this painting is meant to show us Cosimo's elevation by Charles V. And the scene of the eagle with Ganymede is representing the eagle being the imperial uh, bird representing the emperor Charles V and Ganymede representing Cosimo. So rather than an erotic relationship, what we're seeing is a scene of uh, some kind of patronage being exercised. Um, and we can see, however, other images, images uh, that were copies of Michelangelo's representation of this same scene uh, painted for um, his very dear friend and perhaps lover, uh, Tommaso um, Cavalieri. Uh, I'm not going to get into that whole relationship here, uh, but uh, these paintings um, are uh, also very, very beautiful and have a very strong erotic charge to them. So I want to say that all these images that we've been looking at can be looked at with very multivalent interpretations. But this idea of power and here in this Battle of Monte Murlo, very quickly, what I would like to suggest to you here at the end of the talk is really how um, sexual domination comes to represent the domination in the case of Florence of the Grand Duchy. And it's very clearly represented in the Piazza della Signoria itself. And I'm gonna be focusing on this area here, especially the Loggia dei Lanzi, um, which has a lot of statuary as all of you who know Florence uh, can attest. And those of you who uh, attended uh, Jeremy's lecture last week uh, are fully aware of the statuary that's on view is very, very important. 
But what I want to focus on is what it sort of represents about the relationship with sexual domination between men and women. Uh, Yael Evan has said that the Logia de Lancy is a showcase of female subjugation. What does she mean by that? When you look at statues like Cellini's Perseus, which shows Perseus having um, cut off the head of the Medusa. Now the Medusa was such a terrifying monster that you just had to look at her to be turned to stone according to Greek mythology. And here's just one of many antique images. Here's Medusa's head being cut off by Perseus. He can't look at her because of course he will turn to stone if he does, but her face is represented as a monster. That was a typical way of representing Medusa. She's not a monster the way Cellini has represented her. She has very beautiful human features in a way almost mirroring the features of Perseus. It's not necessarily gendered as female if you look at her face, but if you look at her body, her body is a very voluptuous and beautiful, not a monstrous body at all. Um, and she's in a very sort of seductive pose lying there, if you ignore the, you know, the guts and, and blood spurting out of her, you know, of her neck where she's been decapitated. Um, but these scenes are reproduced over and over again, um, these scenes of female subjugation within the Loggia dei Lanzi. Now, you might say, what about Judith and Holofernes? Judith and Holofernes did stand originally in the Loggia dei Lanzi. Judith and Holofernes stood in the position that's now occupied by John Bologna's rape of a Sabine, uh, of a Sabine woman. So the rape of a Sabine woman shows Roman dominance and political power being enacted. In fact, the generation and development of Rome being literally engendered on the bodies of women. And this statue of Judith and Holofernes originally was in the Loggia dei Lanzi. It was taken out to be replaced by the rape of the Sabine women, but it doesn't stop there. Judith and Holofernes originally was commissioned by Cosimo the Elder and stood here in the center of the Medici Gardens in Palazzo Medici Riccardi. After the Medici were chased from Florence in 1494, it was placed here. There's a reproduction of the statue that stands here to this day. Um, but that was considered a place that was too prominent and it was removed from there first to the Loggia dei Lanzi, and then later to the upper chambers of the Palazzo Vecchio, where it stands today in the Sala dei Gigli. So to end, I'd just like to say, like Timoclea putting Alexander's captain down the well, this is a painting by Elisabetta Sirani uh, that represents a scene that's, re uh, that's uh, recounted by Plutarch uh, of one of the captains of Alexander the Great, who, um, um, not only raped Timoclea, but afterwards demanded all her money. And she said she'd thrown all of her precious goods and money down the well. And as he leaned over looking at it, she pushes him in. This is a scene represented by Domenichino of Timoclea going to uh, complain to Alexander who wants to have her put to death for killing one of his captains, but who pardons her after he hears the story. Um, but it's a very definite feminine take on this. And I think if we had more artists from the Renaissance who were women, and if we have more and more uh, of the feminine perspective on these scenes, we'll get a broader spectrum of views of this representation of uh, power and sexual desire at this time. Okay, I'm going to end my talk here and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So um, I know that there will undoubtedly be a lot of comments and perhaps questions. I hope I can answer them. So I turn the floor over to you, Simon. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. That was fabulous. Um, it could have gone on for twice the length. I think you have so much material. Um, so <laughs> maybe we'll come, come back for a second helping at some stage. Um, but as is our, always our um, practice, if you want to ask a question, there's two ways you can do it or make a comment. Uh, you can simply um, uh, put on your video Nice to see Sally there and Ari. So let's see you um, and then unmute yourself and you can speak directly to Lisa that way. Uh, or if you prefer, you can post it in the chat um, and I'll read it out on your behalf. I see there's some comments in the chat already. Um, so from someone, I can't really pronounce it properly, K.V. Ma. So interesting to see the story of Lucrezia on the wedding chair so as if it's a message to women to be faithful or else. 
Artemisia and Caravaggio are very dramatic. She truly used her brush to paint her anger from her own situation. Didn't she paint the Judas story multiple times? Excuse me, I didn't catch the end of that. Um... Sorry, the question uh, is about Artemisia uh, painting Judith. And the question is, did, did, did she paint Judith many times, the Judas story many times? Um... Yes, she did. I, how many times? I'm not certain. I'm not an expert on Artemisia, and a lot is being uncovered really as we speak. In fact, the Advancing Women Artists um, Foundation that was founded by Jane Fortune has done a lot to, you know, explore that. Because until quite recently, um, you know, Artemisia Gentileschi was not that well known, and her works of art were mostly lying around in, you know, sort of storage areas in museums. Um, so yes, there are a variety of paintings of that same scene. If you Google uh, Judith and Holofernes Artemisia, you'll find them all over. Uh, a question from Kim Gottlieb Walker. Did Christine de Pizan's feminist, in inverted commas, writings of the 15th century influence women artists to pursue their talents? What rights did 15th century Florentine women actually have? Those are all really good questions. Um, it was something that I explored a lot in my book, uh, Corresponding Renaissance, um, because Christine de Pizan, um, who was a very, very important writer in the early uh, 1400s, um, she was writing in French, but she came originally from Pisa, um, you know, sort of celebrated in this whole, you know, woman's question, you know, women's talents and abilities in various fields and literature and the arts. And she was, quite well, well known. And not only uh, Christine de Pizan, but uh, Boccaccio's uh, famous women, uh, De Mulieribus Claribus, uh, De Mulieris Claribus, I mean, uh, was well known during this time. And there were many women, and we can see in fact in their letters, let me see if I have one. This is, this is my book, if anybody's interested, um, where women actually refer to these various female heroines, such as Lucretia and others, who were celebrated by Pizan and, um, and Boccaccio especially. Um, but yes, they were big images. Now, women in Florence um, is a big topic. I mean, I give a whole course on this, uh, you know, in my day job. Um, but women's um, rights in Florence in the 15th century were very circumscribed. In fact, the historian Samuel Klein Cohn Jr. has written that Florence in the Renaissance was possibly the worst place to be born a woman in all of Italy. Um, and uh, women uh, had very few legal rights. In order to even sign a contract, they had to have a monualdus, that is a legal uh, a man who would be there to sign for them, to, you know, to verify it. Uh, they did not have the rights uh, over their children. So if a woman decided after her husband died that she wanted to get remarried or return to her family home, she had to leave her children behind with her husband. And women did have dowries. While they were married, the husbands could use the dowry, but the dowry reverted to the woman at the husband's death. There's been a lot of work done on women in Florence in the 15th century. I would recommend anybody who's interested in looking at the works of Christian Klappisch Zuber, uh, to begin with anyway, but since then there's been a lot of work. She did that work in the 1980s. Um, I don't see my book here, uh, but it's Klappisch Zuber, K-L-A-P-I-S-C-H hyphen Z-U-B-E-R, um, about uh, you know, women's lives during that time. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, lots of uh, very complimentary comments in the chat. People have been enjoying themselves. Um, I'm going to bravely jump in and make my traditional weekly plea for donations. Uh, if you've enjoyed the lecture and would like to make a contribution of however much or little that you feel comfortable with, it would be greatly appreciated to help to keep the British Institute going at this time when we've um, lost a great deal of money because of the pandemic. Um, so thanks for that in, 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 in anticipation. Now, um, anybody who's live on the on the Zoom would like to unmute themselves and ask a question. Don't be shy. I saw a question about literacy, Simon. Am I correct? I uh, uh, in, in, in the in the chat. Um, oh yes. Uh, Oh, yes. Yeah, so it, it is a question um, as to whether 
uh, women were generally illiterate and educated in, in the Renaissance. And that is a subject that I thank you for asking that I don't know who asked it, but I, I just saw it briefly in passing. Um, you know, women's literacy is a very, very um, touchy topic during this period of the Renaissance. We know that Florence had one of the highest literacy rates anywhere in Europe uh, in the 15th century. We know this from the tax records, from the Catasto. So there was an adult male literacy of somewhere between 67 and you know, 80%. Um, and we think women's literacy was pretty close. And I've looked at a lot of documents, a lot of notebooks in the Biblioteca Nazionale. And in looking at these notebooks, many of them copied by women, surely nuns, nuns had, you know, very fine literacy, um, but uh, women as well were reading and writing. And one of the things I tried to emphasize um, in my book, Corresponding Renaissance, which are letters written by women, uh, is the fact, like I talk about Margarita Dattini, the wife of the so-called merchant of Prato that Iris Arrigo spoke about. She taught herself to read and write um, and reading and writing were separate skills. I mean, I could go on forever about that. I'm sure in a nerdy way that not everybody wants to hear about, but literacy involves reading and writing involves of course, manipulation and use of the quill and the ink and you know, scoring pages and writing is quite different. In the early modern period, many more people were able to read than could write. But reading and writing in the vernacular was not uncommon uh, among women in Florence during the 15th century. Very good. Okay, um, uh, Kim has asked for the, uh, the, your book title again, the title of your book. Oh, oh the title of my book. Uh, it's called A Corresponding Renaissance. Corresponding Renaissance, Sarah, perhaps write that up in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. By the way, I'd like to say that if anybody is interested to know more about Cassoni chests, and they're fascinating, there are a number of books by Christelle Baskins. Uh, this is one in the collection of the British uh, Institute. I've got it checked out right now, Simon. Uh, <laughs> Good. Uh, Hello. <laughs> illustrated and Christelle Baskins, B-A-S-K-I-N-S, -S, has written all, well, not all, there are other people who have worked on it as well, but she's done fabulous work on these um, illustrate, mm. um, on these, you know, decorated uh, Cassoni. Th thanks for the, the, the reference to the library, uh, Lisa. It's a good opportunity for me to remind people, if you are in Florence at the moment, the library is open. Um, from two to six every afternoon. Um, so do come on by because um, as you probably know, we've got a fantastic collection of uh, art history as well as uh, English literature through the, the ages and history and all, all sorts. So that's that. I'm waiting for you when you can get back to Florence if you are, as I'm sure many of you are, stranded far away and looking forward to the opportunity to return. Um, any more for any more or shall we start to wrap this up? Um, just checking the chat. Um, Kim Gottlieb Walker wants to send you an email. Um, Absolutely. Uh, so um, perhaps, Kim, if you send it to um, director at britishinstitute.it, uh, we'll forward it to Lisa. You can also write to me at my um, website, uh, lisacabarica.com. Oh. Okay, that's, that's also good. Um, very good. So, uh, so I'll perhaps put Lisa's website up. Um, be useful. Okay, I think we've reached the natural end, um, just a bit over the hour. Um, really stimulating talk. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Lisa. Uh, don't forget to check in for some of the art history seminars online if you would like to, all about the post-Renaissance times in Fl Florence and wider Italy. Um, and we'll see, I hope, many of you next week for Deborah Cheverino on the birth of opera. Um, starting also in the Renaissance times and going forward. So um, have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Sarah, for your help. Thank you all very much for participating um, and stay well. Good night. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>